from this unit will start looking at the dislocations in FCC metals. Understanding the dislocation behaviors in FCC metals will serve as a foundation to have a better understanding of dislocation activities in more complex crystal systems such as BCC and HCP. Also, among all the crystal structures, the dislocation behavior in FCC is best understood. Here, let's just quickly recap what we have learned back in undergrad. On this slide, from left to right, you have body-centered cubic BCC, face-centered cubic FCC, and hexagonal closed packed crystal structures, HCP. We will focus on FCC in this and the next few videos. Many metals you're familiar with are FCC in crystal structure. For example, aluminum, nickel, silver, copper, and gold. Back in undergrad material science class, you learned the most closely packed planes in FCC crystal structures are 111 planes, one example is shaded in green here. This is also the slip plane for dislocations in FCC crystal structures. You also learned the most densely packed direction is 110 direction. This is also the Bergs vector direction in FCC crystal structures. And one example is indicated by this red arrow. However, the dislocation activities in FCC metals are a lot more than gliding on the 111 planes along the 110 direction. Let's have a closer look. If we only focus on the 111 planes, they have ABC, ABC stacking. Let's look at the stacking layer by layers. We start by the A layer, as shown by these gray spheres. On top of the A layer, we have the B layer, as shown by the blue spheres. Above the B layer, we have the C layer as shown by these red circles. If we keep stacking in this order, the next layer will come back to A. If you don't believe it, we can remove B and C, and now we see these two A layers, they completely overlap. With this knowledge in mind, we are ready to look at the dislocations again. Back to the undergrad textbook. We learned the Burgess vector is along the 110 direction, as shown here. If we think about ABC, ABC layers, it's going from one B position to another B position. Alternatively, the dislocation can start from one B position, then goes to the C position, then to another B position by taking a small detour. Then the arrows in the second case are along the 112 direction. Since we are taking two steps to achieve one full dislocation, each step is called a partial dislocation. This is a more generic view looking at full dislocations and the partial dislocations. These Burgess vectors correspond to the full dislocations or the perfect dislocations, and all these ones correspond to partial dislocations. One thing you realize is any full dislocations can be a combination of two partial dislocations. If we look at the magnitude of full and the partial dislocations, for full dislocations, it's half 110, and for partial dislocations, it's 1 over 6, 112. Now, let's ask ourselves a question. Is that more energetically favorable to have a full dislocation or to have two partial dislocations? If you recall the elastic properties of dislocations video, we learned the strain energy associated with dislocations is a function of GB square where G is the shear modulus, B is the magnitude of the Burgess vector. For the partial dislocation, the Burgess vector is 1 over 6, 1, 1, 2. So B square is A square over 6. Since we have two partial dislocations, then the total energy is A square over 3. How about a full dislocation? For a full dislocation, the Burgess vector is half 1, 1, 0 then b square is a square over 2. a square over 2 is greater than a square over 3. Therefore, in terms of strain energy, it's energetically favorable to have two partials over one full dislocation. Let's have a closer look at these partial dislocations. The schematic here shows the 110 plane, where this is the 111 direction. And at the stacking of the 111 planes, we have the ABC, ABC stacking. 
to show you we are really viewing the 110 plane, here is the unit cell. Let's focus on this very small lattice distortion here. This is along the 1, 2 bar 1 direction, and this is the partial dislocation we have been referring to. There is a special name for this type of partial dislocations called Shockley partial. Let's look at how locally Shockley partial dislocation interrupts the ABC ABC stacking in the FCC metal. The letters started from A, B, C. Then, as if we are taking away A, then just putting B, C here. Then back to A, B, C. Let's have an even closer look. Starting from here, all the way down to this point, we have a perfect crystal. But starting from here, you have the first kink, then the second kink, then back to a perfect crystal again. For these kinks, since we see a mistake in the stacking, that's why it is called a stacking fault. Also, the atoms on the stacking fault have the twinning relationship with the perfect crystal. So stacking faults can also be viewed as a single atomic layer twin. Before wrapping up today's video, I'd like to introduce a new concept which may help you better understand full dislocations versus partial dislocations. The new concept is called gamma surface. Gamma surface measures the energy of gliding one atomic plane on another. In this gamma surface of the 111 plane of copper, there are three major features. You have those hills or peaks. You have those saddle points like these. You also have the valleys. Those hills and the peaks, they represent a very high energy barrier. Remember we mentioned for FCC crystals, the 111 planes have ABC, ABC stacking. If we start with plane A and move the next plane directly on top to occupy the A position, and this is the energy we need to overcome, apparently it is not energetically favorable. Now, let's look at these saddle points. These saddle points correspond to a local energy minimum. Note, they are not at the global energy minimum. They correspond to the partial dislocations. Last are these valleys, where the energy is at the global minimum, and they correspond to the full dislocations. When we glide atomic planes on top of each other, ideally we want to go from one global minimum to another global minimum, as shown by this blue arrow here. But to go directly along the blue arrow, you have to climb an energy hill, which is not favored. Instead, if you follow the red arrows, you're always going downhill. You have two partial dislocations. You can also end up in the energy minimum. By looking at both the strain energy of dislocations and looking at the gamma surface, we learned it's favorable to have two partials over one full dislocation. I have a question here for you. When doing calculations of the strain energy, the sum of two partial dislocations is less than that of a full dislocation. But now, looking at the gamma surface, the partial dislocations, they are not at the global energy minimum. Instead, they are at the local energy minimum. It seems having the partial dislocation is energetically unfavorable. Why there is such discrepancy? We'll discuss that in the next video.